Hello, Endeavor here. My favorite genre of film is the historical epic. If there is one thing I love, it's three and a half hour long historical dramas from the 50s and 60s. You know, the ones that opened with an overture and were so long that they had to have an intermission in the middle. And the 50s and 60s really were the golden age for this genre. With dozens of classics such as Zulu, How the West Was Won, The Alamo, 55 Days in Peking, and so much more. The quintessential historical epic of the era, in my opinion, was David Lean's 1962 classic Lawrence of Arabia. I reviewed this film with Morgoth on his channel. If you haven't seen it already, I'd highly recommend both seeing Lawrence of Arabia and the stream that we did on it, because it's a film with so many fascinating themes to get into. For me, it's such a great movie because it truly feels epic. The character of Lawrence, his personal journey, the setting of the Middle East during World War I, and the backdrop of an enormous war between empires makes for a phenomenal adventure. The 50s and 60s saw epic set both in ancient and recent history be it the 300 Spartans based on the legendary Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC, or the Longest Day based on the D-Day invasion of 1944, which only happened 18 years prior to the film's release. A lot of them were based on historical events, but there were also a lot which were historical fiction, such as Dr. Zhivago, which was set in the backdrop of the Russian Revolution, or Bridge on the River Kwai, which was set in the Burmese theater of World War II. These films had a varying degree of historical accuracy, but I want to make it clear here that I'm referring to a set of films, not necessarily the actual history that they're based on. Because I don't think the purpose of these films was to be a 100% accurate portrayal of history. Rather, the function that these classic historical epics served was to mythologize history, both ancient and modern, in the relatively new medium of cinema which had just recently come into its own. And though not entirely accurate, films can inspire people to take an interest in learning about history. When I was a teenager, a lot of these films inspired me to start learning about real history. I've often wondered why the 50s and 60s were the golden age for the historical epic and why the genre doesn't seem as strong as it used to. That's not to say great historical epics haven't been made since then. There were good ones in the following decades, but they seem to be fewer and further between. A few of them came out in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but a lot of them feel like a throwback to this era of film. I've also wondered, why is it that recent history doesn't really seem worthy of mythologizing? It'd be very difficult to make a film based on any history post-World War II feel epic. It's really just not that interesting. This is a question that I've had on my mind for several years, but recently I read a book which I believe may shed some light onto why the genre of historical epic died. The book was The Postmodern Condition by Jean-Francois Lyotard. Lyotard defined postmodernity as the disbelief in metanarratives. A metanarrative is a grand historical narrative through which society legitimizes itself, interprets knowledge and experience, and forms its understanding of truth. Three major metanarratives postmodernists often identify are Christianity, the Enlightenment, and Marxism. Christianity, which was the dominant meta-narrative in the West for centuries, presents a grand narrative of creation, divinity, and salvation. Another meta-narrative is the one derived from the Enlightenment, which arose around the 18th century. That society is progressing towards a more prosperous future through a process of enlightenment. Lastly, there's Marxism, the meta-narrative that class struggle is the driving force in history, and that it will culminate in the liberation of the proletariat from their bourgeoisie oppressors and the creation of a classless society. One example Lyotard uses to illustrate the effects of meta-narratives is how they influence science. A Marxist society would see science as a means of liberating the proletariat from the bourgeoisie, while a liberal society would see science as a pathway to human progress. Scientists in 17th century Christian Europe during the Scientific Revolution saw science as a means of revealing the truth of God's creation. Lyotard, who wrote The Postmodern Condition in 1979, claimed that we are living in postmodernity, where we no longer believe in any grand narratives. So we no longer believe in the metaphysical existence of things like the West, or the nation-state, or the proletariat, or bourgeoisie. When did postmodernity begin is debatable, but generally it is said to have started sometime following World War II and to have been fully realized by the late 20th century. According to Lyotard, postmodernity was brought about by technological advances in communications and computing and the rise of mass media.
Now, while Leotard is of the far left, it's important to note that he was describing the phenomenon of postmodernity, not necessarily creating it himself. And while I may have strong disagreements with the implications of this, it is an insight that's worth considering. Because I believe that this might explain the death of my favorite film genre, the historical epic. What makes for a good historical epic? It needs a setting which instills the audience with a sense of the grandiose. It needs a plot involving a conflict of historical proportions. And it needs heroic characters whose personal struggles play a part in this larger historical conflict. In order for a film to do this successfully, there needs to be an understanding of a grand historical meta-narrative being advanced. Let's take the example of Lawrence of Arabia, which I mentioned earlier. In order to make a film like Lawrence of Arabia, there needs to be a metaphysical understanding of what the West is and what Islam is. There needs to be an understanding of what the British Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Arabs are. There needs to be an understanding of the historical importance of places like Jerusalem, Damascus, and Sinai. Why the struggle over these lands matter, and how this is affected by the conflict of the First World War. And there needs to be an understanding of the character of T.E. Lawrence's role in this great conflict. His personal journey and the heroic virtues he embodies, both for the Arabs and the British Empire, in this great historical struggle. But in postmodernity, we don't have any of these metaphysical conceptions which are required in order to tell a majestic story like that of Lawrence of Arabia. We no longer believe in something called the West. We don't understand what constitutes a nation, a kingdom, or an empire. So how can they have heroes? What even are heroic virtues? Why do certain places have historical importance? Why do certain historical events matter? Postmodernism denies that all of these questions have any definitive answer, meaning these truths can't really be expressed through art. Because postmodernism doesn't believe in objective truth. Therefore, you can't make a great historical epic. I believe that these two decades, the 50s and 60s, were the golden age for the historical epic genre because by this point, the medium of film was a couple decades old and had finally come into its own. But it was just before postmodernity had fully kicked in. In the 50s and 60s, people still understood what the West was as a spiritual entity. They still, to some extent, understood the era that they were living in as a part of a grand meta-narrative which connected them to their past. What these films did was mythologize their history through the medium of film for people who still had an authentic culture, and a vision for the future they wanted to pass this history on to. In the 1960s, the American people still had an idea of who they were when films like The Alamo or How the West Was Won came out, as did the British people when Lawrence of Arabia or Zulu were released. And films based on ancient history like The 300 Spartans or Cleopatra would have done the same for just the West in general. These films feel epic because they portray pivotal historical events which were part of the grand meta-narrative of the society they were made for. Likewise, they are able to convey heroism. The characters in these films, whether based on real people or fictional, are shown as key individuals in advancing the meta-narrative under which the audiences lived. Therefore, they actually have something to be heroic toward. I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that while the films of this era mythologize the history of the West, many of the directors weren't themselves of the West, as is so common in Hollywood. But I still did thoroughly enjoy many of these films with such directors. Like Zulu or Cleopatra, there was an authentic culture and definable people these films were made for, even if the directors themselves weren't of that people. For example, the film The Fall of the Roman Empire, which was only loosely based on the reign of Commodus, had such a director. Well, I thought it was subversive that they suggested Rome not granting Roman citizenship to more people contributed to the empire and falling when, in actual fact, granting it to too many people contributed to the fall. I still really enjoyed it as a movie. The setting is grand, the main character is heroic, the plot feels like a conflict of a historical scale, even if it isn't really based on actual history. It was made for a culture which still considered Rome to have an impact on its own development. And I think that the golden age of this genre came to an end when we no longer had a coherent meta-narrative from which we understood our own history and could draw upon. And we no longer had a clear idea of the future generations that we would be mythologizing this history for through film. If I had to put a date on that, I'd probably say it was the late 60s or 70s. After the progressive cultural revolution of those years and the rise of mass media and neoliberal globalism, there are several reasons why good historical epics are increasingly hard to make these days. 
First of all, we have no new source material to draw on. I can't think of a single historical event in the last 50 years that seems like it would make for a good setting for a historical epic. How could you possibly make 21st century America seem epic the same way that How the West Was Won did for 19th century America? You simply couldn't. Likewise, who would be the characters? Western nations don't really have any genuine heroes anymore. Morgoth made an interesting video about when the United States military killed the Iranian general Soleimani. In Iran, he had a massive hero's funeral. The Iranians joked on TV that America had no equivalent hero that they could kill as revenge. The Iranians asked, who are America's heroes? Spongebob? Spider-Man? Today, we don't have legendary heroes like T.E. Lawrence, Davy Crockett, or King Leonidas who could serve as the protagonist in a historical epic. Like, for example, I'll use a historical film which I really like that's based on more recent history, Black Hawk Down. Now, I thought Black Hawk Down was an excellent war movie, but was it really a historical epic? I'd say no. It had the intensity you'd expect from a good war film, it's shot really well, and it does a great job portraying the Battle of Mogadishu. So it is a good movie. The problem is that you don't really get the sense that the Battle of Mogadishu is really historically important for America. It doesn't really feel like a turning point in some kind of grand historical narrative. Because ultimately, it was a UN-backed operation trying to bring liberalism to the third world. Not really something worth mythologizing. Secondly, not only do we have no new historical source material to draw from in postmodernity, we've lost any coherent meta-narrative which connects us to events further back in our history. So it's difficult to portray historical events as meaningful to postmodern society. Hence, it's difficult to make a story feel epic. To do so, a film must convey a spiritual meaning in the historical struggle on which it's based, and that the character's actions are impactful on the historical events that the film portrays. This can only be done if there's a specific coherent culture which the film is being made for. It needs to mythologize historical events in a way that they both feel impactful on the culture which presently exists and worthy of remembering into the future. For the characters to be heroic, there must be an idea of the good which they are sacrificing for. But we no longer have this in postmodernity. We no longer believe in any higher spiritual meaning to society, and we no longer have a coherent culture which art can be made for. For a great example of how postmodernism ruins this genre, we can look at the pile of trash that is Kingdom of Heaven, the 2005 Ridley Scott film set during the Crusades in the 12th century. Other than being flagrant anti-Christian and anti-white propaganda, the reason Kingdom of Heaven, as a historical epic, sucks so much is that it utterly fails to capture the very real spiritual struggle that the Crusades were for 12th century Christendom. Rather than portraying the deep religious importance of the Crusades for Europe, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and the Crusaders, it portrays it as entirely cynical, all the sympathetic characters are these postmodern agnostics who don't really believe in Christianity, while all the villains are these cartoonish religious fanatics who just use Christianity as a justification for bloodlust, while the Muslims are portrayed as these 21st century liberal egalitarians. Not only is this a grossly inaccurate portrayal of the actual beliefs of the Christian Knights of the Crusades, it completely ruins the film because it doesn't convey any kind of spiritual meaning or historical importance to the events that it's based on. For example, the protagonist is meant to be Balian of Ibelin, played by Orlando Bloom, the Christian knight who led the defense of Jerusalem against Saladin in 1187. He's portrayed as this agnostic, kind of spiritual but not religious knight of the Crusades. At the climax of the film, when they're preparing for Saladin's siege of Jerusalem, he gives a speech where he literally says that the Christian religious sites in Jerusalem are no more holy than the Jewish and Islamic ones. That Christians have no special claim to Jerusalem and that they're fighting for the people. Obviously, this is outrageously inaccurate. The Christian religious connection to Jerusalem was the entire point of defending the city, and they didn't consider other religions' holy sites to be legitimate. But for the purposes of this film, this destroys any drama that the climax could possibly have. The Siege of Jerusalem in 1187 is one of the most dramatic episodes in the history of Christianity, but this film tells us that it's meaningless. And at the end, when Jerusalem falls, Saladin just lets Balian evacuate the city's population, which is also not true. The Muslims made the Christians pay ransom, but for the ones that couldn't, they were enslaved. But inaccuracy aside, from the postmodern perspective of the film, there was no point of even defending the city to begin with. 
If Jerusalem had no transcendental value, why not just give it to the Muslims? And the character of Balian is not heroic at all. He's not a hero for Christendom. He doesn't even believe in their religion or their cause. So who is he a hero for? Vague egalitarian universalism? The real Balian of Ibelin didn't believe this. He was deeply religious and spiritually invested in the cause of the Crusades. He was a hero of Christendom. But the film doesn't mythologize the Crusades or the figure of Balian for any coherent culture. Who was Kingdom of Heaven made for? Certainly not Christians or Europeans. So they can't portray these events as truly meaningful. This postmodern nihilistic lens through which Kingdom of Heaven presents history is why it utterly fails to be an epic film. Now let's compare Kingdom of Heaven to a good historical epic, my favorite film of all time, Gettysburg. I made an entire video on Gettysburg and Gods and Generals on why they're great movies, but to illustrate how Gettysburg succeeds where Kingdom of Heaven fails, let's contrast the climaxes of these two films. The climax of a postmodern nihilistic film like Kingdom of Heaven to a film that's not nihilistic. The climax in Gettysburg is General Pickett's charge on Cemetery Ridge on the final day of the battle. During the Confederate artillery barrage before their charge, the character of General Louis Armistead gives a speech to a British military observer with the Confederate Army about his home state of Virginia and what the Civil War means to them. He speaks of the ancestry of his men, the famous Virginians they're related to, the small towns that they're from, the struggle that they've been through in the war, and why they're ready to give their lives for their home state of Virginia. And the character of General Louis Armistead, who was mortally wounded in the charge, is heroic because he sacrifices for a meaningful cause. This makes the final climax of the film so much more impactful because it conveys a deep historical meaning to the battle that the film portrays. And there's a clear audience that the film was made for, Americans. It presents the Civil War as a histrionic chapter in the meta-narrative of the traditional identity of America. And that's why Gettysburg is a great historical epic. But Gettysburg was released in 1993, about three decades after the golden age of the historical epic genre. Why were they able to create a great epic well after the arrival of postmodernity? I'd say it's because Gettysburg was made by people with a deep connection to the American Civil War. Most of them had ancestors who fought, and they truly cared about their heritage being passed on to future generations. They knew exactly who they were making the film for, and understood the history they were mythologizing in the film as part of a grand narrative which brought about their idea of America. So they were able to overcome postmodernity. The historical epic is my personal favorite genre of film, but I do believe that the decline of this genre over the last several decades tells us a lot about art in general and what postmodernity really robs us of. It deconstructs all meaning in our lives because we lack a coherent meta-narrative to understand the world through. And this is reflected in the low quality of art created in postmodernity. Since we no longer believe in different peoples, art can't be made for anyone, so it's made for everyone, and thus it appeals to no one. It has no standards because we don't believe in objective standards. It isn't rooted in any kind of past, meaning it has no future to inspire. Since we no longer believe in objective truth, it fails to convey any truths about the world. And that's why we can't make good art in postmodernity, including my favorite film genre, the historical epic. So how can we overcome the soul-crushing weight of postmodernity? Well, what did these epics from the 50s and 60s have that we don't have today? They were made for a specific culture. They presented history as impactful on the meta-narratives under which the people they were made for understood their society. And they conveyed heroic virtues through the legendary historical heroes they portrayed. I don't think this is impossible to do again. A recent historical epic I really enjoyed was the Russian film Union of Salvation, based on the Decemberist Revolt of 1825 in St. Petersburg. It was made by Russians, for Russians, about their own history. And it really did feel like an epic film. Union of Salvation was released as recently as 2019, so it can still be done. Art needs to be made for someone. We need to have a culture of our own, not a universal culture in which no one belongs. One that is exclusive, which art can be made explicitly for. We need an objective understanding of truth, which can be conveyed through art. And we need an understanding of the eternal. A narrative which connects us to our history and gives us a vision for the future beyond our own lives. That's what's required to make art meaningful again. If we're able to escape the nihilism and emptiness of postmodernity, maybe someday we'll have more three-hour-long epic movies which mythologize our history for future generations.
If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter or Telegram, and if you'd like to support my work with a donation, you can do that too. With the ever-increasing threat of deplatforming on YouTube, I also ask that you follow me on BitChute, where you can find exclusive videos that I've made. All links are in the description. Thank you for listening. Till next time, Endeavor.